Welcome. I'm delighted to see you here. We have an amazing panel of fascinating people related to the subject of the evening, which is of interest, I think, to all of us, which is the development of the Purple Line and the Capitol Crescent Trail decided. I have uh, a few uh, items that I'd like to go through. The first is I want to explain that uh, Purple Line now was formally founded in 2002, but not until 20 years of speculation over the abandoned freight rail route between Silver Spring and Bethesda was resolved in its purchase by a four-sided county council. Over time, uh, people like Harry Sanders, our patron, uh, his family continues to support this project energetically. Uh, the project grew in scope to its current when the state became interested and designated it a real project. Through all of this, uh, we have, of course, advocated in various places, in various ways, uh, and come to this point. Uh, now, we remain active, although many suggested that we were done when the construction started. On the contrary, we are actively involved in continuing to monitor the project, assisting where we can, summoning folks like yourselves from time to time to discuss progress and issues. We're active with the Purple Line Corridor Coalition, which some of you uh, may be familiar with. If you're not, I urge you to become so. It was invented by Garrett Knapp of the Smart Growth Center at the University of Maryland to deal with opposition to the project by inventing a menu of issues that had to be addressed in a continuous way over the entire project, uh, combining the regional aspects of the Purple Line with their bi-county issues. We deal with housing, we deal with jobs, with uh, the commercial life of the corridor, and Purple Line now is participating in what we call the last mile, which is the development of the projects outside the contract limits but around the stops. Uh, there is a housing policy coming out within the next few months, which I think you will hear quite a bit about. Uh, and it, of course, looks after affordable housing opportunities along the Purple Line. Uh, the bio, bios of the panelists are in uh, on a piece of paper, which you have. Uh, it, these are significant people. Back in the beginning, it was only advocates. Now it's the people who are actually making the project happen. And it is just fabulous to assemble here, uh, starting with the last name first, with Peter Vanderwart, who is the new CEO of the Purple Line Transit Partners, who are actually building it. So join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you. You're on. <laughs> All right. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, and the thanks for the Purple Line now to, to have me here. Uh, this is my fourth month, so I, I already apologize for not being able to answer maybe all your questions, but I'll do my best. Um, I just wanted to go through a few slides, a few highlights of um, what we have accomplished in the last six months. And I know the group project, especially for many of you in the room, has been much older, um, but just focusing on uh, all the accomplishment in the last six months, and I just want to flip through some slides. Um, back early in the year, uh, only five miles out of the 60 miles were under construction. Uh, now we can say that it's double that. 10 miles of the 60 miles are under construction, and for everybody that, you know, uh, who follows us, uh, you can actually see that and notice it. Manpower in the field, uh, early in the year we had about 450 craft, now it's 650 craft. You can see a pretty rapid spike in manpower in the field and it will continue to go up. Uh, dollars fabricated slash constructed, we had at the beginning of the year about 250 million, and this is pure construction work, not design, not support, just pure construction and materials, and we're now at 310 million. And something notable I wanted to highlight, um, obviously we have 26 light rail train sets consisting of five modules. So 130 modules of the trains that are being fabricated elsewhere. 
uh, they come from Spain, they go to Elmira in New York State. And so beginning of the year we only had five modules there, and now we have 18. So that's also quite a significant jump. Go to the next slide, show some nice photos. First, the Bethesda elevator shaft. Um, as you know, it's a, it's a 160 to 170 foot deep shaft. Um, which is needed to put in the elevators, ventilation systems, obviously the stop for the purple line and the connection to the red line. And on the left beginning of the year we were excavating about 40 feet deep and now we're a massive 90 feet deep. Uh, we've still got about 60 to 70 feet to go before we move the bottom up, but we, we stopped where we are, we're going to pour the concrete walls first to get st stability and then build it out to the sides uh, before we go any deeper. Uh, next slide is familiar for many of you. Two golf cart underpasses of the Columbia Country Club. Uh, see the difference beginning of the year and now. I haven't seen any golf clubs in my life that have such nice golf cart underpasses. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the support, by the way, that we're getting in that area. Um, Manchester PlayStation, um, again, complete difference from beginning of the year uh, to wh where we are now. Uh, concrete base slabs are in, and you see on the walls, you see we're pouring concrete walls uh, as we speak. And this will be one of the first stations to, to open. The next one is the Plymouth Tunnel. It's a, a thousand feet long the tunnel. Beginning of the year we were just breaking through uh, with, with excavation and now it's starting to really look like a pit tunnel with uh, building out the arch. Um, and Concrete base slab is also in place, so theoretically we can put down rail, but there's a lot more that needs to happen before we can do that. But significant boot progress there as well. This, I think, is one of the most striking images. Uh, beginning of the year at the Glenridge Operations and Maintenance Yard, this is two football fields side by side. Uh, and now, actually, the steel erection started in May, and we're actually going to reach the top uh, next week, which is a big milestone. And what I mentioned already, <laughs> light wheel vehicle assembly in Elmira, in the beginning of the year, we had five modules in manufacturing in Elmira at, at, uh, at, the, at the shop. And now we have 18 modules, and on the right you see the actual prototype pilots train, which um, later in this year will actually be running that train in the shop in Elmira. Um, and just get the little bugs out. Um, I, I know this forum today is more about the uh, Capital Crescent Trail than about our construction progress elsewhere, but I just wanted to to recognize what we have accomplished in the last six months. Um, just a little background on the, the trail. The Purple Line is designing it, but not without significant input from Montgomery County. And we're obviously building it as well. Uh, Montgomery County will ultimately own and maintain the, the trail. And, and you know, recently met with Council Member Fritzen to discuss uh, you know, how we can get to the finish line on, on, on that. and, and it's 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 my it's our it's, it's all of our our intent to open the trail as soon as possible, but it has to be safe. And you, you can imagine construction is 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 on or adjacent to the trail, and if it's not safe for the public or for our construction workers, we we, we can simply not open it early. Now. Opening the trail, and there's maybe a misconception, is not necessarily tied to when the project is complete. There's a year of testing and commissioning, almost a year of testing and commissioning in the schedule, which is not considered construction. And we're, we're going to look at options together to, to open, you know, not at the end, but when we start testing and commissioning. And if we can do that in a safe, safe way, we will open it. 
before we can see the purple line running, running there. Um, one caveat, we, we may be able to open it, but then we may have to shut it down for a few days to do some punch list work or do some landscaping, but that, that will be announced, of course. There's still a few more years to go, uh, so I cannot you know, pick, a, pick a date, but that's our intent, and we get full support from the economy on that. Next slide. I just want to focus on what's going to be different. Uh, we call it a better and safer the trail. Um, the old the old trail was packed in gravel. The new trail will be paved, which the, the bicyclists are obviously going to like. The width is ranging from eight to ten feet. It will be ranging from ten to twelve feet. Um, there is no shoulders on the existing trail. The two feet shoulders in most places on the new trail. Um, access, obviously there's always access to the trail, but we're going to formalize that with the 23 access points, reducing any abrupt trail entries. Um, we're going to inc increase in length, uh, end up as a 4.3 mile trail extending into downtown Silver Spring. Uh, there's going to be connections with three other trails, the Rock Creek Trail, the Silver Spring Green Trail, and the Metropolitan Branch Trail. And there's, there, there's other upgrades, if you will, um, th that are part of the Purple Line project is extending the Green Trail along Wade Avenue, building the uh, University of Maryland Campus Trail, and add bike lanes to certain, certain roads. This is a, a rendering that was included in the environmental study. It does not represent the final design or condition as it will be, uh, I don't know, Carla, will we, will we, will we have updated drawings uh, at so some point? What we do have on the website, Purple Line MD, right now is we have the full alignment that you can look at, and it shows where the trail is exactly aligned and where it splits, because in some areas it is split away from the actual alignment based on how that has to be through the So those are currently there now, you can see them. Thank you. This is the this is a map. It's also online with uh, with the access points that I just mentioned to you. Uh, it's hard to see probably now, but go go see that on on the website. And my last slide is where you can find us. Uh, PurpleLineMD.com. Uh, email us outreach at PLTCLLC.com. We have a 24/7 hotline, which is there. Um, <coughs> Just a little, just a little tidbit of news. So I'm from a country called Holland, the Netherlands, and it's the only country in the world where there's more bikes than people. 22 million bikes, and we only have 17 million. <laughs> Councilmember Hans Bremer, a longtime and strong supporter of the Purple Line, fresh off a legislative triumph of yes. relaxing the regulations on accessory dwelling in this city, which is related to transit and housing. Absolutely. Thank Hans you, Bremer. Bremer. Thank you. All right. I don't have a presentation. Uh, I don't have a presentation, so maybe put the light back up. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here, and thank you to Purple Line now for continuing to organize and do community outreach and, and keep the community engagement and the focus on the project as we, as we go, work through the construction process uh, and towards the success of this project. Uh, I'll start by just sharing a little history. So first of all, I serve on the council. I'm one of the four at large council members. Member Friedson is also on the council with me, and I served on the transportation committee in my first term, and I've served there now again on my uh, here in my third term, and um, I got involved in Montgomery County thanks to the community activism of Advocates for the Purple Line. I, uh, I remember well moving into my neighborhood East Silver Spring, and. Uh, thought the natural thing to do as a, as a homeowner would be to attend my civic association. And uh, so I went to my first 
meeting and there was a big fight about the Purple Line um, because uh, Sligo Avenue was one of the potential alignments. Bob Colvin is here. Bob was president of the ESCA, the East Silver Spring Civic Association. I think you actually survived a coup attempt that night, Bob. Uh, it was an effort to elect different leadership that was going to fight the Purple Line even more aggressively. Um, Bob served for 38 years. Is that, the, is that how long as, as president of ESCA, Bob? 38 years as president. 32, 32. Thank you, Bob. Um, so I thought uh, Bob, Bob is an incredible community activist and, and community leader, and uh, I, I think it's fantastic that you're here tonight. So I just I remember walking away from that meeting thinking, um, you know, I, I'm surprised that there is such an effort to uh, oppose a transit project. I would think that a transit project would be something that the community would want to figure out how to get behind. Um, and then, I don't know, a week or two later, I got a phone call about 9 o'clock at night on my home phone, and it was a guy asking me if I would be, if I knew much about the Purple Line. It was Ben Ross, and Ben Ross cold called me. I don't know why. To this day, I don't know why. Uh, it was a voter file or it was something, but he cold called me at home. And uh, he wanted to just talk about the Purple Line and ended up inviting me to a meeting of the Action Committee for Transit, uh, which I attended and uh, got to learn more about Purple Line. I think you're doing community outreach in East Silver Spring because of the controversies around that particular component. And so I got to meet Harry and Ben and Webb Smedley is here and uh, John Carroll and Jim Clark and all the whole crew and uh, Barbara and B. And, so that is how I got my start in Montgomery County politics, uh, fighting for the Purple Line. And um, when I ran for office in 2006, I had a mailer that said, I'm going to build a Purple Line or die trying. And uh, I didn't win that election. Uh, <laughs> I did get emails from a guy uh, who you all know, but I won't name, saying that he thought he, I was going to win. And if I did, I only had 1,332 days to live. <laughs> and he sent me a couple more of those, counting down until the end of my first term. Um, but uh, anyway, that stuck with me. Um, <clears throat> well, creepy. So, uh, anyway, I want to just say I think this Purple Line is really uh, just a, such an example of community activism. I, I, I don't know how many projects exist because the community brought them to life, but I, there's no question that that's why this project exists. And um, it is a project that has had decades of champions and uh, support from all across Montgomery County. It has survived numerous attempts to kill it, and uh, it has, the, the support for it has grown so much over the years. Um, we are looking forward to its completion, uh, Peter, and uh, we ask you to, you know, get through the construction phase as fast as possible, and, um, and there is a lot of implementation issues. I am not going to necessarily go into each of those tonight, um, but uh, you know, we, we've had to sort of shift from being build it now to let's get it done right and let's kind of monitor the progress and, and be an advocate for the community to make sure that the impacts are managed carefully. And um, that's an important part of this conversation. Um, a couple issues I thought I would just touch on. The first is housing. We had a very interesting meeting this week. Uh, Councilmember Friedson and I are served together on the Fed Committee, which I chair, and Councilmember Duando is on that committee as well. Um, and we talked about the housing, the, the Purple Line Corridor Plan that Ralph mentioned. The Purple Line now is a, me a member of the University of Maryland's administered program, which just received a grant, a federal grant of over a million dollars. So they're going to have some real resources to bring to the conversation planning and um, policy development for the corridor. Um, what was very interesting was they identified a need to uh, get 19,000 housing units into programs that provide a kind of regulation of the rent to promote affordability um, over, you know, so that the corridor itself would continue to be a corridor that is a has affordable housing and is accessible to people uh, of modest incomes. And um, it's, I think I was uh, I was pleased to see that number. I think the overall amount of housing units in the corridor is close to about 60,000, something like that. Um, and they said that Montgomery County share of that is about 45%. And so that's about 8,500 units 
that they are saying Montgomery County needs to figure out how to um, you know, get into regulated programs. The good news is there's 900 already, uh, and there are 1,700 in the pipeline. And what you see going up around you here in Bethesda is part of that pipeline. And we have a couple of buildings going up in Bethesda I'm really excited about that our, we expect will take advantage of an impact tax waiver that we've created, and 25% of the building will go up with MPDUs. 25% of the building will be MPDUs in a building that may be nearly 300 feet tall, one of them on Wisconsin Avenue. So a, a privately owned building that's not a mission-driven housing developer or a public-owned housing developer, it's purely a private venture, building a, a building that's 25% affordable, 99-year um, protections on the units, is um, absolutely, I think, unprecedented and thrilling. And uh, we may get more than one of those right here in Bethesda. Uh, so the, the new development pipeline is a huge part of creating the affordable housing to feed towards that goal. We're also gonna have to go past that. And we just celebrated uh, yesterday, $100 million of county financing that has gone towards new housing. Uh, we created about 3,500 housing units over the last year, whether through preservation or new production. About 2,000 of them set aside as affordable. Um, and um, so I think we'll need to kind of amp up that focus uh, in the Purple Line quarter. Um, so I think the good news is we can definitely achieve the, the goal for the county. I think it's going to take you know, a number of years. It's not going to be something we'll do overnight. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about rent control in the Purple Line quarter. I think a better way for us to go is supporting a pipeline of new construction and to bring in nonprofit developers and for the county to purchase buildings. And that kind of approach, I think, can get us to what is, I think, an achievable goal. Um, second issue I want to talk about is the transportation access issues, the biking and pedestrian and other access issues in the quarter. Um, we have a program in the capital budget that we, we call the BIPAs, uh, which is the Bicycle Pedestrian Priority Area Projects. And we have funded um, more projects for the walk sheds of Purple Line stations. And uh, there's, there's one going in downtown Silver Spring. The Silver Spring Bike Loop is funded under that. Uh, the Bethesda, I can't see if you're, that's a, is that a red light? That means I'm over? Wow. All right. Uh, I arrived here with nothing exactly to say, and I went on too long. Um, so there is a, there's a lot to talk about with that. Last thing I want to say before I sit down is economic development. You know, I think we're, we, we haven't yet had the conversation about how the, the Purple Line Quarter is going to contribute to the economic development of the county and the region, but that was a huge part of the agenda. And all of economic activities happening in urban areas. That, that's, you know, the suburban economies are, are, are really sort of slowing down. And the Purple Line is our, that's our future. That is our economic future. And we need to be figuring out how to build a tech economy and attract the kind of companies that are going to be following Amazon to the region, that it grow up near the University of Maryland, you know, biotech, tech, IT. We need to position this quarter, this Purple Line quarter, as a tech quarter. Just as we position the 270 tech quarter, the Purple Line tech quarter needs to become a branded, marketed initiative. So uh, I intend to be working with the state uh, to try to put something together. But up until now, I think it's been the threat of the Purple Line, not the opportunity of the Purple Line. And it's time for us to really shift gears and uh, make something like that happen. Okay, thank you very much. You may have noticed uh, part of the environment is changing much more quickly than the Purple Line, and it has to do with bicycle lands. Peter Gray has been uh, a bicycle activist for a long time and joined our board two years ago, and we've been delighted to have him. And uh, his success is demonstrated by the emergence of bicycle lanes all over the county and a bicycle town. So we're deeply appreciative of your advocacy. Welcome. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, here on behalf of the Washington Area Bicyclists Association and the Capital Trails Coalition, which you may not have heard of before. That's a group of dozens of organizations, governmental, private, 
bids, uh, Montgomery planning, uh, you name it, all around the, the, the region. And uh, this is something that was organized by WABA, the National Park Service, Rails to Trails Coalition, uh, Coalition to Capital Crescent Trail is a member of this uh, Capital Trails Coalition, and many others. The Capital Trails Coalition has 40 different projects, trail projects, that it's following closely now, including the Capital Crescent Trail between, Silver, between Bethesda and Silver Spring, connecting up to the Met Branch at the Silver Spring Transit Center. As a representative of advocates, working to make biking a safe and fun experience for everyone of every age and ability, completion of the CCT along the Purple Line is one of the top priorities in the DC area. Therefore, I'm following the pro progress of this project very carefully and encourage everyone here to do the same. If, I, if you take away anything from what I'm saying tonight, it's that I'm hoping that you all will add your eyes and ears uh, to the progress of this project. I can be reached at peteraguaba.org, and I'm happy to communicate about the trail uh, as the construction process goes forward over the next few years. Now, sit at, sitting at that other table are some folks from MCDOT and planning. And they're going to set out some more of the details of the trail in their presentations tonight. But I think there are a few salient points that we as members of the public should focus on. Number one, building the tunnel underneath Wisconsin Avenue. It's going to take millions of dollars that is not currently in the capital uh, budget for Montgomery County to build a separate tunnel just for the trail uh, underneath Wisconsin Avenue, and we're going to need to push Hans and Andrew and the council to make sure that that is funded. Um, the design looks great, but it's not going to get built absent that significant outlay by county government. Number two, we need parks and MCDOT to design and build an entrance from Elm Street Park right by here to the trail. Uh, the, that will allow easy access to the trail. And there are good uh, ideas about what they want to do with that, but that's something that we need to, to push for, and I know is, is near and dear to those of you who live close to here. Um, while construction is underway, and again, it's going to be uh, at least a few years until the trail is open, people still need a safe and intuitive route between Bethesda and Silver Spring, and the interim trail route that the county has sent out is problematic, to say the least. We should continue to push MCDOT and the town and villages of Chevy Chase to create a direct side bicycle route on the streets between Bethesda and Rock Creek as quickly as possible. This is needed during the years between now and when the trail is actually open. There are a bunch of access points that you saw uh, on the plan, and I urge you to pay attention to those ones that you know, you're know you close to, because people who live in those areas are going to have the best ideas about how that should be constructed and how it will actually allow for <coughs> people on bikes and people walking, people with strollers and wheelchairs, etc., to access those points. And so, we need to make sure that those are, are, are designed in a way that will maximize access to the trail and to the, and to the rail. And we need to hold MTA, the Purple Line Partners, and MCDOT accountable so that all of us can get from these adjacent neighborhoods onto the Capitol Crescent Trail. We need to, in general, uh, keep up a continuous and transparent communication from the people who are building this and who are overseeing it, like MCDOT and MTA, to, to, to keep track of any design changes that might affect the trail and the trail user experience. And then we have to insist that the trail, or at least segments of it, be open as soon as possible. As, as Peter uh, said earlier, the, the project's going to be constructed, and then there's going to be 12 plus months of 
testing of the trains along the line. It seems possible that the trail, which was designed not to interfere with the, the rail tracks, should be able to be open safely to the public many months before the Purple Line trains actually carry the first passengers. MTA and Purple Line partners can and should do this, and we will need your help in keeping the pressure on to make sure that that happens. Um, and then there are issues with the way that the uh, trail is going to come into the uh, Silver Spring Transit Center and meet the uh, um, uh, Metropolitan Branch Trail. We need to attend to, to those issues. Overall, this means making sure that the public receives more email updates, periodic uh, public forums like this one, to make sure we can all keep track of any design changes on this trail project. In my advocacy here, it's been my experience that with the help of some of our elected officials, um, we have been able to get great response from MTA, Purple Light Partners, and MCDOT. They want us to be informed about this, and but it, it's not going to happen unless we're insisting on it. So I guess my, my bottom line here is we need to pay attention to this. And in order for this to, to be a really great trail, uh, trail, the devil's in the details, and we need to keep pressing on those details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. The county's role in the project has taken quite some time to emerge. Uh, there are two very capable people I want to introduce to you. Uh, first, of course, is our speaker, Matt Johnson. But I'd also like to introduce Maricela Cordoba, who is the Purple Line Project Coordinator for MUCDA. <laughs> and Matt Johnson is uh, involved in realizing the county's investment in vice fund. CCT. So welcome to us, Matt Johnson. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, so as Ralph said, my, uh, my role at MCDOT is to um, build a lot of our bicycle pedestrian facilities that we're working on throughout the county. Um, Councilmember Rimmer mentioned the bicycle pedestrian priority area program, the FIPA program. I'm the project manager for that program. Um, and we've been seeing, a, we've been doing a lot of work around the county. We have a lot of stuff that's in design and a lot of stuff that's working through the pipeline. Um, today I want to talk about the Capital Crescent Trail and its connections at either end. Um, and I do see a lot of familiar faces out there, so I've worked with a lot of you in various, various roles in various neighborhoods. Uh, the trail is being built by the Purple Line, um, but we're funding the, the construction of that trail. And we agree that it should open as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, that trail will connect downtown Bethesda with downtown Silver Spring. Um, Peter went through a lot of the, um, the details already, so I don't think we need to rehash that. But um, a lot of access points. When the trail gets to Elm Street Park here in, in Chevy Chase, uh, there actually will be eventually two routes um, to get from the end of the CCT through Bethesda over to the trailhead going toward Georgetown. Uh, one of those routes uh, is the tunnel, which um, Peter mentioned. That tunnel is funded for design, but not for construction. We are advancing the design right now, working with the Parks Department on the tunnel portal location in Elm Street Park. Um, and of course, the tunnel shell is being constructed by the, uh, the developer who's building the, uh, the new the car property building where the Apex building used to be. They're building a shell that we will then outfit at some point in the future. But there is a gap between the edge of the, the car building underneath Wisconsin Avenue down Elm Street to the actual uh, trailhead on the north end of Elm Street Park. The other route, and this is a project that I manage, is what we call the Capital Crescent Surface Trail. This is not an interim trail, it is a permanent trail that will exist. Um, it will go down along 47th Street along the western edge of Elm Street Park uh, as a shared use path. We just presented the design of that path to the town council at Chevy Chase last week. Uh, and then <coughs> at that point, at the corner of Willow and 47th, it will split so that we separate bicyclists and pedestrians for the duration of the, the journey through, through downtown Bethesda. Mm -hmm. And it will operate as a two-way cycle track along the north side of, sorry, along the south side of Willow Lane and along the north side of Bethesda Avenue uh, over to the intersection of Woodman Avenue where the trailhead um, going toward Georgetown is. Um, in Bethesda, as part of that project, we are also designing, um, we're redesigning the intersection of Woodmont and Bethesda Avenues. There will be a protected bike crossing through that intersection. 
Um, we'll be tightening up the turn radii to really slow down those turning vehicles, so we're working to protect pedestrians as well. And as part of that, we're going to be building a, the first phase of the Woodlawn Avenue cycle track, which will go from Miller Lane up to um, Montgomery Lane. That's the first phase of a two-way cycle track on Woodlawn Avenue. That's all going to open at the same time as the Cabot Crescent Service Trail. Uh, and then beyond that, there's a, a second phase that will extend that cycle track south on Woodland Avenue to Wisconsin Avenue and north on Woodland Avenue up to Norfolk um, uh, Avenue. We're also working on the Montgomery Lane and Avenue cycle track in downtown Bethesda that will run east-west um, from Woodland Avenue over to Pearl Street and potentially could extend further east at some point in the future to, the, to one of those connections that will connect to the Capitol Crescent Trail at east-west highway at the overcrossing there. Um, so that's part of the bicycle network in Bethesda that we're building. Um, we're also working to improve pedestrian safety in all those corridors and improve the pedestrian environment as well. So that's part of that last mile uh, that, that has been mentioned, is getting people to the Capitol Crescent Trail. Uh, in Silver Spring, we have already built um, separated bike lanes on Spring Street. That was opened in October <coughs> of 2017. And we continue, we're continuing to work on improving those. We just began work um, a few weeks ago to install uh, improved barriers on two blocks of that of that street to test out different barrier types. And we've started construction earlier this year on the 2nd Avenue, Wayne Avenue cycle track, which will connect um, the uh, Spring Street bike lanes at the edge of the Woodside neighborhood down to the Silver Spring Transit Center and then continue over toward um, Georgia Avenue where cycles can continue along the Silver Spring Green Trail, which currently exists about as far as Whole Foods and is being constructed as part of the Purple Line project as well. Um, we also have projects in design. Um, we're looking at separated bike lanes on Dixon Avenue, and we're looking at building a secure bike parking facility um, underneath the garage 555 at the corner of Bonaparte and Dixon Avenue so that cyclists can leave their bike in a secure, um, lit, um, protected location and take the purple line to work or take the red line to work, um, as, as, or, or even if they work in downtown Silver Spring, to bike to downtown Silver Spring and leave their bike while they're, while they're at their job in Silver Spring. Uh, so a lot of things that are in the pipeline right now, um, we're also uh, going to be restarting our study for uh, looking at a cycle track on Fenton Street in downtown Silver Spring. Um, a lot of work left to do, we're only in the study phase, um, but that project is going to get off the ground again this fall, so expect a public meeting in the near future for that project. And uh, so a lot of things that we're working on, and I'm sure we're going to get some questions about that, so I'll look forward to talking about that in the, in the moderated panel. But, other than that, I think that that's a pretty good overview of what we're working on, and it's a really exciting time to be working at MCDOT, and I'm sure a very exciting time for you all to be <coughs> witnessing this stuff happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. The coordination of the design of this project, of course, exists in, in county government at several levels, and of course the Montgomery County Planning Board has an essential role in dealing with the consequences of the arrival of the Purple Line and is already been do, doing so with the revision of master plans and the anticipated changes in land use that are recognized. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce David Onspacher, who is officially the Transportation Supervisor for the Montgomery County Planning Board. David. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having us. I'm, um, as was said, I manage, uh, trans I'm a transportation supervisor. I manage our multimodal transportation planning group at the planning department. So that includes um, planning department's efforts on Vision Zero, bus rapid transit, the Purple Line, Corridor Seas Transway, bicycle planning, uh, pedestrian planning. So we do it all. Um, so at the planning department, we do a number of things. We do plans um, and we do a lot of data. And I'm going to try and quickly talk about a couple of those things. So in terms of planning, um, Matt's, Matt talked about some of the projects that are ongoing right now. We know the Purple Line is going on right now. Peter's advocating uh, greatly for some of the projects, and our council members are helping us with the funding and moving everything forward. But the planning department thinks forward. And so um, I was the project manager for the county's bicycle master plan, and so I want to talk a bit about um, the ideas in the bicycle master plan for the Capitol Crescent Trail. And so there's a couple of things. So we all know that the Capitol Crescent Trail can be quite crowded on the busiest days, uh, especially to the west uh, from Woodmont Avenue West. Um, and it's only going get, to get worse, right? When the Purple Line opens, when the new Red Line station opens, with all the development that is coming um, in downtown Bethesda and the bicycle improvements, it's going to continue to grow. And so one of the recommendations, um, and this is a good thing, 
Um, one of the um, recommendations in the plan is we've got a trail bed, a uh, pretty wide trail bed, and we need to think about widening it. Right now, um, it can be quite narrow in some locations. Uh, bicycling, walking, there's social activities. People want to be able to walk and bike next to each other, and you can't do that. You're always looking uh, at who's behind you, who's uh, ahead of you, and so one of the recommendations is to use the full trail bed that we have from the old rail corridor and widen that. Um, number two, um, the Capitol Crescent Trail will provide a great connection, undoubtedly, to our purple line stations and to our red line stations during daylight hours, but we have not adequately uh, funded lighting on the Capitol Crescent Trail. We have, there's some lighting in some select locations at turnouts, um, and at intersections, uh, at junctions of the trail, but we have not fully lighted the whole trail. What we have done, and what the council did a number of years ago, was to fund the conduit for future lighting, so the piping that's underground, so that we can more easily come back and put lighting in. But we're going to need to think about that, especially if we want people to be using um, our, uh, our, our huge investment in the trail um, after hours, when it gets dark, which can be 4 or 5 o'clock. Um, during the, the winter months. We're also going to, we're going to need to think about that on the, the new portion of the trail that's being built. We're also going to need to think about it on the, the existing portion uh, to the west of, of Bethesda. Um, the old Apex building, that's where the movie theater was, the building that was torn down, which will house the, um, the future red line entrance and the purple line station entrance. Um, that building getting torn down provided a ton of benefits for us. Um, it, uh, it helped us to enlarge in the platform for the Purple Line. It helped to provide a new tunnel uh, for the Capitol Crescent Trail. But it also is providing space for secure bicycle parking. And to me, this is one of the, the significant investments that I don't think is getting talked about a lot. But um, the developer provided a shell directly adjacent to the Capitol Crescent Trail, directly adjacent to the two stations, to accommodate hundreds of bikes. Um, certainly, two, 300, 400, 500 bikes, I think, is what we're we're looking at. So people will be able to ride their bike from wherever they are, leave it at the, the Purple Line and Red Line Station, and within uh, you know a minute be at the Purple Line Station. It's a little bit longer to get down to the Red Line. Um, so that shell is there. You can see it now. We've been in it. Um, <clears throat> but we haven't funded, we haven't studied, and we haven't funded how we're going to outfit that. So that's another thing that we're going to need to think about in the coming years. Um, the, at the planning department, we certainly do plans, but we also think about data. Uh, so for some of you that have, were involved in the Bicycle Master Plan or have followed our work, um, you might be familiar with our bike stress map. The idea of this was to try and, um, was to identify the amount of stress people that are bicycling feel on every road um, and trail in the county. And I think we had a lot of success with that. We are now, my staff is now kicking off a pedestrian master plan, and we're doing the same thing for pedestrians. We're systematically going through the county, evaluating every, um, every road, every sidewalk, uh, every crossing um, for the, the quality of the pedestrian experience. And that's going to help us do a number of things. It's going to help us to prioritize recommendations, um, <clears throat> but it's also going to help us to look at and prioritize our, our investments um, for the Purple Line stations. Uh, as many of you know, the, in, in some locations, the access today to the future stations is not that great. The Purple Line project is not is going to improve um, pedestrian and bicycle access along the corridor, but not to the stations. Um, and so this tool is going to help us to systematically understand where those investments need to occur on a very detailed level. So we're we'll look for that in the coming months. And that's what I have. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, our uh, concluding speaker is uh, the. Montgomery County Council member from District 1, the western part of the county, uh, who also sits on the FED, uh, Housing and Education Development Committee of the County Council. It's a great pleasure to see you here. So, uh, what Ralph didn't tell you is I'm speaking because the third technical expert wasn't available <laughs> tonight. And uh, you heard earlier from the distinguished council member and I get to hear from me. So I uh, appreciate it, but I'm Andrew Friedson. I have the great privilege of representing this amazing community in District 1. Uh, and I am a Bethesda resident. I live a mile from Metro and for, actually for, within a mile of two Metro stations and uh, one future Purple Line station. We're extremely excited 
uh, about that, and uh, it's great to be here. Tonight, this is, uh, believe it or not, a project that's as old as I am. I talk about that uh, quite a bit. It literally started in my birth year. Um, you can do the math and uh, figure it out. Few people have. Um, I, am, I am just slightly older than your term uh, as a uh, civic leader, which, by the way, God bless you. Uh, that is uh, a very, very difficult, uh, difficult role uh, to, to be in. But uh, I also have a bit of a history, though. I haven't been around for that long, and I haven't been in elective office for very long at all, only for about eight months. But um, I was a senior policy advisor and deputy chief of staff at the state level. Part of my portfolio was the Board of Public Works. I was there when many of the land acquisitions occurred that, that took place. I was there uh, when actually the uh, design bid build P3 uh, was debated and, uh, and, and ultimately uh, approved. And uh, I was student body president at University of Maryland and a student activist uh, before that and worked uh, quite a bit on this issue as the alignment uh, was being heavily debated uh, at the University of Maryland, which is one of the key segments, of course, of this project. So I, uh, I'm new to public office and new to this particular role, but I'm not new uh, to the Purple Line and not new to understanding how much of an environmental and equity uh, and uh, an economic development imperative this is uh, for our community here, but also for connecting uh, Montgomery County East-West and also Montgomery County to Prince George's County in the region. Uh, to each other and, and, and creating the connective tissue in a, a, a truly uh, functional transportation network uh, that we've needed for, for many, many years. Uh, thank you to Ralph, Christine, Peter Gray, the entire Purple Line Now team for your uh, focus tonight specifically on the trail. I uh, think that this is an absolutely critical component of the Purple Line uh, and for many, uh, including some that you uh, are here tonight, this is just as important as uh, the light rail itself. And I, you know, uh, oftentimes when people think of trails, they think of quality of life, they think of recreational opportunities, and certainly it is that, but it's also a key part of our transportation network uh, as well, and I think that's critical as we uh, discuss this and we're talking about a better, safer trail, as was mentioned uh, earlier, that we're talking about a better, safe, safer way to travel for many of our users of our transportation network. And so that's why this is such an important uh, conversation that we're having uh, here uh, today. Uh, just to give some context, in May 2015, uh, Montgomery Parks counted 80,000 trips on the trail in one month uh, alone. There have been many counts that looked at uh, 1 million trips a year uh, on the trail. This is one of the most heavily used trails in the entire United States of America. And so this conversation that we're having today is not only one of the most important transportation projects that is occurring uh, right here, it's also one of the most important trails that we are uh, improving uh, to make sure that not only will it continue to be what it has been, but will be better in uh, position to take on uh, new roles for more and more people uh, for, for years and decades and generations to come. Now my focus uh, is some of the many things that you've heard uh, tonight have been, are, you know, are and continue to be uh, my focus. Peter, I appreciate you uh, mentioning the uh, emphasis on opening the trail as soon as possible because of what I stated, because of how many people rely on this trail, because it's not just about recreation and uh, quality of life and uh, discretionary trips. It's a vital way that people get to and from work, to and from uh, where they are going. Uh, we need to open this as quickly as possible. And of course, it needs to be safe. We need to uh, work together. Uh, but I don't like to think I'm fighting this. I'm fighting for this. I like to think I'm working with, and, uh, with Hans uh, Reamer and, 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 and our committee, with the Transportation Environment Committee that he also uh, serves on, which I'm kind of an ex-officio uh, member, it feels like, because I show up to a lot of those uh, meetings as a non-voting uh, non uh, member of, of, of the council. And our state partners, Jared uh, Salman, who you heard introduced earlier, has been working on this. Uh, as well, who represents a large uh, area that will be uh, uh, that will be uh, benefited uh, from this. And I look forward to continuing that work and making sure that we get the trail open as quickly uh, as we possibly can, uh, as soon as it is safe uh, for it to be open. Um, I also don't believe, as you heard Peter Gray mention, uh, that the uh, we can have a complete Capital Crescent Trail unless we complete the tunnel. Uh, this is uh, not a discretionary item. This is not. Uh, 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 let's see if we can, when we can. This is something that we need to have open and ready and funded <coughs> when the trail is ready and when the train uh, is open. And I'm committed to working together with 
Councilmember Reamer with our colleagues to make sure that that is uh, funded. When uh, when Peter was mentioning each of our roles, he mentioned that our job is the money. So I heard you loud and clear. I'm 100% on board. I want to make sure absolutely that tunnel uh, is uh, uh, ready to open uh, and that we are ready to move forward. And um, you know, the other thing that I'm focused on that hasn't been mentioned yet, but is the tree canopy. Uh, we want to make sure that we restore uh, and return a tree canopy because that is a critical part of uh, quality of life as we talk about the environmental benefits that this is going to have uh, on our community. We want to not just do no harm, the idea here uh, is to improve. But if we're going to make this happen, if we're going to be able to invest the dollars that need to be invested, if we're going to do the work that needs to be done, we need everybody in this room and everybody who is not in this room that each of you uh, has in your network to really be all in uh, on this effort. You know, uh, Hans Riemer and Andrew Friedson and a few of us on the council can't do this alone. Uh, we're committed, we want to help, we want to support it, but if we are going to invest the type of resources that are needed, we need a groundswell of community support that has always been uh, the hallmark, as Hans mentioned earlier, uh, of what has made this project work for, for the past uh, 33 years and what is finally bringing it, uh, bringing it home uh, for many of us. So uh, I think together with your help, we can have a modern world-class trail to go with a modern world-class light rail train system, and I look forward to each of your support and look forward to working together and making it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Our newest recruit. <laughs> that is, that is. Andrew skipped over. I'm going to now go to a collection of questions that you've submitted, but I'm going to take moderator's privilege by asking the first question myself. And it concerns a subject that Andrew mentioned quickly in passing, and that has to do with trees. Probably the most dramatic and depressing aspect of the project so far has been the clearing of the rights of way for the river line. Now, we know that uh, because of objection to the frequency of the transformer stations along the line, the spacing between them was increased to reduce their number, but it required an increase in the voltage uh, that was transmitted to operate the trains. And that resulted in a wider right-of-way that had to be cleared. I uh, teach sustainability at the University of Maryland, and I've been doing so since I retired. It's the biggest problem we face, and all recommendations for adaptation of cities to climate change have to do with maintaining the tree cover. That's what will keep us cool as we experience what Paris is experiencing today. So my question for whoever wants to answer it is, we understand that there is necessity of destroying trees to do grading. That's obvious. In other cases, the trees are removed because they prevent a hazard to the wires once they're installed. We also know that the reforestation requirements of the contract set aside an area for reforestation only a small percentage of which is adjacent to the project itself. So my question for those of you who know more about this than I do, uh, by the way, I'm grateful to Webb Smedley for pointing out to me that there is, uh, at the state level, uh, recommendations for trees which can survive and without interfering with high tension lines. Uh, are there any plans to get to the point where we can replant trees which will not be a threat to the catenary lines once the project is complete, or are we looking at a forever deforested environment? I don't know if anybody exactly has the right answer here. Uh, oh, there you go. Um, I totally agree with you. Uh, the, the trail here, Capitol Crescent Trail, Wayne Avenue, uh, just very stark, but uh, the county plants a lot of trees, and we can plant trees in our right-of-way that's adjacent to the line, and uh, really try to regrow as much as possible there, and we can push the state to do it. I don't know about tree species specifically. You asked a great question. I wish you knew the answer, uh, or have given us a tip that you were going to ask that question so we could find out the answer before you asked it. Uh, but uh, if anyone knows, there, there might be someone here in the audience who has the expertise about that uh, particular question. But let's, let's, let's explore that and uh, let's just say anything we can do to restore the tree canopy in the right of way or adjacent to it, we've got to do it because that is critical to the success of this 
trail experience and the whole project itself. Excellent. And if anyone else has any ideas on how to deal with us, uh, please be in touch with us. I see a hand rising. Yeah, I, I, I guess my question is, who among the various instrumentalities here is responsible for the landscape? So, so is everyone with their hands in their pockets? Is it Purple Line Home uh, Group or who? I would hope that the technical staff of the project might be able to give us some help. Yeah, so for it, so obviously the landscaping within what within a construction zone and directly adjacent uh, to the purple line, PLTP is responsible for for all the landscaping there. And uh, just back to the previous question, I think it's it's obvious or maybe not, but that those trees that are being removed are are being removed because they are directly in the construction zone and directly adjacent to where the over, overhead catenary system will will be um, and it's also having heavy trees next to the catenary system could also be a risk to the operation of the purple line itself uh, so we're not removing trees where they don't have to be removed uh, and as far as replanting and I know the two of my best communication people here, if any of you can answer, but I believe there's about 13 acres of, of reforestation planned within the Purple Line corridor, and, and then another, I think, 80 acres or so outside. So, uh, but yeah, any input uh, will be more than welcome to, to listen and, and, and see what we can do. Okay, thank you. Can I ask more than that? Just quickly. Yes, I, uh, I was briefly uh, the tree steward for the Capital Pheasant Trail under our Montgomery Parks Volunteer Program. Uh, and uh, what I see along the Georgetown Grand right away are uh, many diseased and uh, overgrown trees with vines on private property next to the trail. Uh, it would be uh, behoove you to look at a public-private partnership to uh, create a uh, source of funding and expertise that would uh, encourage private property owners along the right of way uh, to maintain the trees, to, uh, okay. to increase that canopy. All right, great. Really Thanks. Um, I neglected to point out a couple of features. First, MTA has a terrific, I guess with the assistance of the partnership, handout related to bicycles. We've passed out a number of copies. We didn't quite have enough for everyone. I'd also direct you to the MTA website, which now has information on the subject I just raised. Uh, it has illustrative planted site plans of the entire project. Is that right? That's correct. I think so. And so it shows trees in a sense, but it's drawn at a scale which uh, I would describe as an architect as sort of non-committal because they're very small. So uh, part of our role is to continue the small scale discussion of this question and try to assist people to come to resolution of it because it really is, has to do with the quality of it. All right, to audience questions. I have two related to outreach. I favor the Purple Line Light Rail Capital Crescent Trail, but during demolition construction is virtually moribund in its communication and outreach. Uh, to we residents, business people, and even uh, its own community advisory team, representatives for timely, accurate interaction. What will you do to fix it promptly? And there's another question about uh, outreach and communication related specifically to the Capitol Crescent Trail. Can we have any information about that? Uh, I, I can speak to the, the elements of the Capitol Crescent Trail, uh, the service trail route that I'm working on at Bethesda, and also the bit of work that we're doing on to, uh, sort of either end. Uh, and that is that our policy is to have um, as much community engagement as possible. Uh, if there are, if you are a member of a citizen group and you want us to come speak to your, your association, we are um, happy to come. I have cards up here at the front if you if you want um, to get my contact information. Um, since the Purple Line is handling the construction of the Cattle Crescent Trail between Bethesda and Silver Spring, I would defer any questions about that public outreach to, to Peter. Um, but as, as far as MCDOT goes, uh, we are trying to do a better job. We're trying to improve uh, the outreach that we do with community as, as we go forward. Um, so with all the projects that I mentioned during my, my part of the talk, um, we've had community meetings early on in the process. 
uh, and continued co community meetings as um, people have requested them. And we're looking for ways to, to better engage people um, as we go forward, because we know that not everyone can come to those kind of meetings that you have after work, um, after sort of normal working hours. So we are trying to, to find more uh, more innovative ways to get out and, and, and talk to the community. So, because we want to hear from you. you. You're the ones who live here and work here. Um, and you're the ones who know your community, what your community's needs are. So we want to hear from you. Thank you. A brief change of pace. Are there any active lawsuits against the Purple Line? <laughs> Seeing no hands. Is there an MTA representative present? In the back. Three lawsuits. Let's go back. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this is a congratulation for Peter. Impressive that construction is taking place all over the length of the line. Please thank the folks who are making this happen. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, this is a regional question. Starting in Bethesda, will I be able to walk to College Park in theory? Having represented only one county here, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I'm not going to go all the way into Prince George's, I have no idea. Uh, but you will be able to walk from, um, from Bethesda to the border with Prince George's County, uh, through the Long Branch and through the Tacoma Lane Lake uh, communities. The trail does run in, along the entire, is there, there's a hiker biker trail or pedestrian connection along the whole route, right? No. Well, you can't take University Boulevard all the way to University of Maryland College Park right now. You can take the purple line. Or you can take the purple line. If you walk, then you can take the purple line. Come on, come over to Prince George's County. Right now, the way that it's designed, you'll be able to walk to the transit center. And then at the transit center, you'll be able to walk along the green uh, trail from Wayne Avenue all the way down to Sligo Creek Parkway. So you'll have connections to Rock Creek, to Sligo, and to the Met Branch. Further east of that is uh, problematic, to say the least, for pedestrians especially. So I had another question about the connection to the trolley trail in College Park. I gather that falls into the same category. To the, you know the trolley trail, the old trolley route that goes through College Park. Is that, there is a connection? I don't know all the specifics of that in Prince George's, but the trolley trail does cross the alignment at uh, what used to be called Paint Branch Parkway and is now Campus Drive. Um, so there will be, if, if there's at least a sidewalk along the purple line through there. I'm not sure if it's wide enough to be a shared use path or not. There is a connection at Paint Branch Parkway to the, to the purple campus drive to the truck trail. Speaking of sidewalks, I think this is a question that relates to interim circulation. Um, as an interim route, what about sidewalks on east-west highway from, and whoever wrote this might help me interpret it, Brookville Road and Beach Drive would make there sense. There you go. That'll fit. How about a sidewalk? Yeah, so we know that a lot of you are frustrated with the interim route that has been um, set out for the duration of the closure, and we certainly understand that. Um, the, the real issue that we face uh, with the interim route is if you look at a map between Bethesda, well, I guess I'd say between Wisconsin Avenue and Rock Creek Park, there really are not very many connections. South of the Beltway, you have um, Walter Reed National Naval Medical Center, which we can't have people biking through. Then you have Jones Ridge Road, which is where the interim route is. South of that, we have the Columbia Country Club, which unless you're golfing, you can't use to get through the, the connection. Then we have East West Highway. And then south of that, we have the, the town of Chevy Chase. Um, and the town um, so far has not um, been willing to let us put bike route signs through the, through the town. And, we, we don't control those streets, so that's up to the town. 
And we're certainly, we have been working with the town, we will continue to work with the town on that. But what that really leaves us with is the only two viable routes, your Jones Bridge Road and East West Highway. And neither of those are very fun places to walk or bike, and we understand that. Um, as for East West Highway, the reason the route, uh, the Jones Bridge Road was route, the Jones Bridge Road route was picked was because um, it was felt that the sidewalks on East West Highway are too narrow and are too close to the roadway to really be comfortable. And so as a result, we picked the Jones Bridge Road alternative instead, which I know is not a whole lot better than the East West Highway, but that, that's why East West Highway was not chosen. Now, that's for the sign route, but if you're navigating this on your own, um, you're allowed to bike on any or walk on any public road in the county. Um, or on, and you're also allowed to bike on the sidewalk in, in most of Montgomery County. There may be some municipalities that bar it. Um, so you're welcome to pick a route that's not the sign route, but as for the sign route, that's why the route was picked that was picked. So and we, we understand that it was not our first choice either. There, are, there actually is no sidewalk on that stretch of East West Highway that he mentioned. Ralph, can I ask you? So I just wanted to, to say it's an issue, the sidewalk issue is something we've heard a lot of in the District 18 delegation. It's something we've raised to SHA, the State Highway Administration, and with MDOT. Um, there was actually a whole mess load of traffic this morning on the Rocky Parcel Service specifically about that. So it's something I'm going to be working with my colleagues in District 18 on. If you're interested, uh, please come and see me. We'd love to get your support. We're probably going to do a, a neighborhood petition throughout to show the support we've been doing that in some of the other areas that uh, Councilman Fries and I have been working on. So. Hopefully we'll, we'll get this done, but it's going to be an ongoing process with the SHA. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, Matt's the answer to a lot of questions. I've got a couple more for you. <laughs> what are the plans for making the bike car intersection at the Talbot Street Bridge safe for pedestrians and bikers? He's expressed concerns to cross two-way car lanes in the new bridge that's proposed. Maybe you can speak about the bridge in general. Yeah, so the Talbot, uh, the old Talbot Street Bridge has been um, demolished. Uh, it's not, the, the pieces of it are still there because they're going to be using them in, in uh, I believe, in, in, for one of the station's art installations. Um, but the old bridge is gone. The old bridge was actually an old railroad turntable that the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had used to turn steam locomotives around. They turned it upside down and made it into a bridge, which was um, wide enough for about one car. Um, and so it was one way. And um, what was that? Two way. It, it was a two way bridge. All oh, right, it was two, but only one, one direction at a time. Right. Um, so. Um, uh, the, the new bridge will be much wider and it will have room for two lanes of traffic. Um, so it will be two way for vehicles and it will also have, um, I believe, a, a 12 foot shared use path along one side of the bridge. Uh, there is a crossing at, at one end, there will be a crosswalk at one end of the bridge. Um, and I believe it will be a four way stop. So, in terms of the, the, the safety, we're not super concerned about that, but if, they, if there are issues that come up, we, we can work on those in the future. But it is designed with minimum curve radii so that people are going to turn slowly and, and it's going to four-way stop. But there will be a separate bicycle pedestrian path that is not shared with the, the vehicles, which in the old days you were just on the road with the, with the cars. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, question for the trail along the CSX track south of Ballard Street where there is no sound wall. Can existing trees be left between the rail and existing CSX fence? If not, why? The trail will be at grade for this section all the way down to Spring Street. This, this has to do with details of that section. Yeah, I, it's like I said, I, I can probably have to get Back to you on that question. Uh, we we have a we have a certified uh, the tree expert on our, on our, the team who looks at, at every tree that needs to be removed. It, it could be because of the roots, could be because of the bare branches, could be the proximity to the to the to the light rail. Um, so, uh, will you, John, if you can write this question down, and I'd like to look into the details of this. Great. Right. Thank you. Uh, can there be murals on retaining walls along the trail? This may speak to the art project. I want to talk about possibility. <laughs> the answer is, if you ride Metro, you'll see lots of murals on walls. 
so the county will own and maintain the trail. Um, I don't know if we've had any discussions internally yet about um, what the art on the trail will look like, whether there's any art plan, but um, I don't see why that it would not be possible. I think that's something we could certainly look at going forward, but I don't know if there have been any discussions, and I don't want to put Maricela on the spot who just started this week. She's shaking her head. Okay, so that's certainly something that we can, we can consider. Excellent. Uh, here is the question. Is it possible to open the trail in sections? Residents resent the closure very much. <laughs> I guess this, this goes into uh, what I did try to say. We'll, we'll look at every option to open the entire trail or parts of the trail as early as it's safe to do so. So if there's a section that can be identified where we've, we've completed construction and it makes sense to open the trail in parts, then we'll definitely look at that. I'm going to pass the mic to Councilmember Friedson, but I have to go to the Pedestrian, Bicycle, and Traffic Safety Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, so I'm going to walk out. But we have been asking for this at every step, and we need to keep doing it. Here, here. Uh, I, I might be stepping up to the uh, the big kid table over here, but uh, yeah, I just uh, I, I just want to reiterate that we're committed to this. We're working together on it, at, you know, with our state partners, with uh, the PLTP. Uh, and uh, at the council, we totally understand how important this is. It's something that I'm personally deeply invested in as somebody who lives along the trail and uh, we'll continue to push for it and we have a commitment that, uh, that they are gonna follow through and uh, it's my job as the person who represents you to make sure that that happens and I'm committed to doing that and I know they are as well. Um. One thing that we need to focus on is uh, what MTA's role in all of this is. And they're not here, so I guess we can say anything we want. But um, they are here. but seriously, they, they have responsibility, oversight over uh, how uh, PLTP constructs this and and what happens with the operation once it's going forward. And in conversations that I've had with with folks from MTA. They're definitely looking at this issue, and they uh, feel that, first of all, they can't make a prediction about any of this until the trail is actually completed. Um, you know, or at least when they know that the trail will be completed. So I think this is something that all of us should pay attention to, and that in a year, 18 months from now, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get more of a definitive answer on this. And, you know, with help from people like uh, our state delegation or whatever, that we can uh, focus on this issue better. Uh, here's a recommendation for design characteristics along the trail. The trail between Bethesda and Silver Spring needs to be lighted and open 24 hours a day. Is this in the plans? I think I spoke to that a little bit before. There, um, there is, there are plans for a very limited amount of lighting on the Capitol Crescent Trail between Bethesda and Silver Spring, but the conduit, the piping underground was provided, and so at a later date, uh, if funding becomes available, uh, lighting can be added. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that the trail will be open 24-7, um, but the, there's some debate as to whether the tunnel will be the tunnel. You may remember the old tunnel that was there did close at a certain time. Uh, and the tunnel, I believe, is being designed to allow it to be closed at night. Um, but I don't know whether it actually will be. But I believe that the rest of the trail will be open 24-7. Um, as the new CCT trail grows in use between Bethesda and Silver Spring, what planning for plan must be planning, planning options exist to widen it or add a separate walking path. So the county council, so I've been working on the Purple Line and the Capital Crescent Trail project since 2010. Um, back in 2010, I think the decision was made to, um, to go with the width of a trail that was generally 12 feet wide with two foot shoulders on either side. Um, maybe in some locations there will be the ability to widen it, I don't think that there is much ability to widen it uh, consistently, though. Um, following legal protocols, uh, if this question has been asked and answered, uh, you can say so, but I think it's for you, Matt. 
In addition to bicycle networks in Silver Spring and Bethesda, what is the county doing to improve bicycle access to the other 21 access points for those neighborhoods? That's an excellent question. Um, and uh, what I would say is that the county is working on um, projects in a variety of areas. I can't say that we're working on projects at every single access point, but uh, we have a long time to work on those projects over, over time. We are um, underway with a study uh, at for three for Abipas at three of the Purple Line stations: the the Long Branch station, the Piney Branch University station, and the Tacoma Lake Lake station. Um, those three Abipas are all contiguous, as it happens. So we're looking at sort of a whole network there of what what's possible. Um, as I already mentioned, um, Silver Spring with us to have projects that are underway, and. Um, we're certainly uh, open to looking at additional BIPAs as fun as the council makes funding available. Um, the, the Lintonsville station, I believe, is in a BIPA. The Woodside station is also in a BIPA, um, but not the Silver Spring BIPA. It's in, it's in the North and West Silver Spring BIPA. Um, so there are other opportunities as we go forward with um, with building this network, and we're certainly open to suggestions. So if you guys have projects that you think are really needed to get you to the Purple Line or to the Cal Crescent Trail, um, please let us know so we can make sure those products are, are uh, in the pipeline. I appreciate that, and I know it was mentioned earlier that it's the county council, the distinguished county council member and my, uh, exclusive, separate, um, my job to make sure that funding is available, but I do want to point out, I mean, it's really important that the county executive hears from you. I mean, they're here, you know, he's here representing the county executive, the executive agency, but ultimately, even though the council gets to make the ultimate funding decisions, the proposed budget is really a huge area where the priorities get determined. And ultimately, we need the county executive to be willing to implement. And so I would encourage you, I know a lot of the effort oftentimes is advocating at the council after the budget has already been proposed. We're going into a new capital budget this year. The county executive is going to have to put forward what his priorities are. We will make amendments to that, but that's what starts the conversation. And where the conversation starts is a big indicator of where it ends. I mean, we can debate on the margins, but it's really hard to completely eliminate projects and add on new projects when those projects can cost tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And so it's really important that if you care about BIPAs, if you care about transportation that you make sure that the county executive knows that because he needs to and he needs to realize that any cuts to what are already currently funded what have been planned for uh, that are going to come with significant concerns from uh, from residents because you know in the previous cuts that had to be made and there were some very difficult fiscal decisions that had to be made but transportation projects many bike improvement projects were the first ones that were cut because they cost a lot of money. So it's really important to make sure that if you, these are things that you care about, they are very expensive, they do get cut very easily, that you make sure that you're fighting for them, that you're advocating for them. You don't wait until the decision point at the council because at that point, you know, it's the fourth quarter of the game and it's hard to just show up then. So we're committed, I'm committed, but we need you in the game as early as possible. Uh, so, so the planning department does plans, we do data, but we also approve developments. And one way we're getting a lot of access improvements to the trail is through development projects. So um, many of the 23 access or whatever was uh, points have been made available through development projects. So at Silver Spring, for example, at Spring Street by the Fenwick uh, apartment, the old post office, the trail there was put in by the Fenwick building. Uh, Elizabeth Square is going to be looking at upgrades connections at Apple, Apple Lane and Fenwick Lane. So there's three in close proximity. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but at the Connecticut Avenue station, the New Dell Muse on New Dell Road is going to be doing some access improvements to get people from Connecticut Avenue to the trail. So and this is happening all along the corridor and the development staff is, um, at the planning department is helping to facilitate this. Um, this is something maybe David should have said. The, the Bicycle Master Plan, which uh, is a, a really fabulous plan, has a lot of detail about all these different uh, areas that are along the, the, the rail corridor. So if you're interested in something near you, I 
suggest that you go to the bike master plan and see what is proposed in that plan. And then if you feel passionate about it, advocate with the council, uh, contact me, and uh, you know, WABA has advocates all over the place that are advocating for these things, and, and we can help push that ahead as well. All right, thank you. In closing, I have two questions. So it's a fine grain one and a general policy one. What alternative do you prefer for the CCT crossing of Little Falls Parkway? A road diet, B, A, B, cross at Arlington Road, or C, a $6 million bridge? <laughs> so, I probably should hand this to the planning uh, department since it really was a planning decision. For the, I'm sure everybody here understands, but for maybe one or two people who don't know what the reference to the question is, which is totally off topic, by the way, because it's not in the Purple Line corridor, uh, but I understand it's one that's near and dear uh, to people's heart. But the road diet that is temporary, there was a decision at the planning board to make it permanent, where Little, Little Falls Parkway has the trail crossing. It's actually neither a county road nor obviously a county trail. It's a parks road and a parks trail. It's completely overseen by the parks department. It was completely the decision of the planning uh, board. Um, the planning board decided on an option that was not one of the ones considered, not only not recommended, but not considered by uh, the parks staff. Um, I believe in road diets. I, I think that the, the the clapping was sarcastic because they were like, you believe in road diets, but not sure if you believe in actual diets. But uh, at any rate, um, but I believe in road diets. I actually think you look at the, if you, there you go. You, you look at the data, the data does not support, I think, the decision that was made by the planning board, I believe, uh, in data. Uh, I've been a big advocate on the council since I uh, have shown up that we need to stop thinking exclusively about failing intersections just on throughput, just on efficiency, just on how quickly cars get through. It, it shouldn't be possible, but currently it is based on our planning, that you could have a, 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 a failing intersection where you have no collisions and no fatalities, but that cars don't move fast enough, but you could have a non-failing intersection when that's working from a public policy standpoint, where you have multiple deaths but cars move quickly, and that is not a way that we build modern, livable, walkable, accessible communities, and that's not the way that shared streets works, and that's not the commitment that we've made to, uh, to have Vision Zero. Uh, and the, you know, the Parks Department itself has their own version of Vision Zero that they've committed to, and I don't think that the decision that was made uh, reflects that. Uh, we will see what happens with that decision. It's not a county council decision, it's a planning board uh, decision, but ultimately has to be funded through a capital project. We don't know what's gonna happen with the capital project, and so we'll have to assess that at that time. My understanding uh, from the planning board uh, and from the parks department is that the current situation is going to continue until there's a new project that's funded, and so it is still temporary. It wasn't voted on to make it permanent, but it will continue being temporary with a two-lane, with the temporary plastic bollards um, until such time as a new project is funded and there's still questions about uh, how and when and if that will take place. Thank you. Uh, they're beginning to pick up the chairs. One last question. What improvements are planned for providing bike lanes to Montgomery County Schools? Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak to it from a county-wide perspective. Um, our process of building um, bike facilities goes, comes from a lot of different um, parts of the agency. I'm in the Division of Transportation Engineering. We build the big capital projects. So um, when we're building new roads, we, we, it is our policy to try and put bike lanes on, separate bike lanes wherever possible. Um, we are following the recommendations in the bike master plan and the other applicable master plans. Um, but our, our division of highway services frequently restripes roads to have bike lanes the, as part of resurfacing projects. So as roads go through resurfacing, um, that, for example, is about to happen on Executive Boulevard in White Flint. The streets being resurfaced, and we're going to be getting separated bike lanes out of that project. 
Um, so there's a lot of different ways that these happen, and I can't speak to every single school um, in the county, but I would encourage you to look at the bike master plan on the website that, that um, Dave's team has worked on. And if you have a particular school that you're interested in that you think really needs bike lanes, I encourage you to let us know so we can make sure that we're aware of it and, and we're working on that. So I too am a big believer in data, and so one of the things that we did with the bicycle master plan is we evaluated bicycle access to every single school in the county. Uh, there's 180 or some, so it took some time. Um, but we systematically uh, came up with a metric, you know, 100% being the most connected for a kid, 0% being the worst, and we gave a number to every kid. This is actually based on real detailed data. We can tell you how comfortable it is from every house in the school zone to, um, to every school. Uh, what percent can get there on a kid-friendly network. So take a look at it. NCI is not one of the Great, thank you very much. I just want to thank the, the, the planning department has done really terrific work with all of that, particularly on, on not just the bike master plan, but on all of these additional studies that have been done. You know, one area with, with it, uh, with, that relates to schools are bike racks. We don't even have bike racks. Uh, at every school so I mean there are you know while bike lanes are really important and I'm not diminishing that those are huge projects that cost a lot of money but there's a ton of low-hanging fruit that we could handle much quicker and so we have to think in many of these instances of you know what's the long-term plan like with the bike master plan which is a multi-billion dollar comprehensive effort but what are the, what's the low-hanging fruit to get us closer where we want to go uh, in the meantime of what are some bike facilities that we can provide to folks in obvious areas like schools, like public uh, areas, like parks and other places to uh, make it easier to, to, to ride your bikes. And so uh, hopeful that we can all work together on that as well. Great, thank you. I'm pleased to tell you that every question was either answered or referred. Thank you very much for coming. Please join me in welcoming again Peter Vandor. Thank you for coming and watch out for our next uh, event, which will likely be east of here.